All right, g'day, mate. Welcome to episode 61 of the Exponential Performance Podcast. In today's episode, we've got something a little bit special for you, a little bit different. Welcome to the Exponential Performance Podcast. Join sports scientist and performance coach Maddie Graham to find out how to train smarter and maximize your performance no matter who you are. G'day, mate. Welcome to episode 61. It is good to have you here. Nick Taylor, how are you doing, mate? I am good, thank you. I am good. I'm good. Yeah, a, bit, a bit chilly. It's been a, a very crisp day in Dunedin, but it's all good. The t- temperature's definitely starting to drop. Winter is definitely on its way. We've got yes. uh, snow down on the hills here. So nice. uh, looking forward to ski season. Yes. Cross-country ski season for you. You're definitely coming up and doing some. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have to lock in a weekend and do that. That'd be good. We're going to be up there every weekend, so come on and get it. (laughs) Now, guys, today we've got something a little bit different for you. Um, I got an email from a guy that I I coach, um, have coached in the past, and his name is Milan Brodnina. He's originally from the Czech Republic, lived in New Zealand for, uh, I think he's 10 years or something like that. It's quite a long time. But um, Milan sent me an email a while ago saying that He's been listening to the podcast and he kind of loves the Harden Up project like we all do. Uh, However, the Harden Up project does, it makes you take a bit of a look at yourself in ways that you might not have looked at yourself uh, before. And what Milan emailed me asking about was that after about 10 years of endurance racing, which uh, which became a massive part of his life, he took it really seriously as only endurance athletes can. Um, you know, part-time endurance athletes that are that are working and how involved they get in their sport. And then he stepped away from the sport after about 10 years of the sport of adventure racing, multi-sporting, uh, ultra-endurance mountain biking, performing at a high level. And he found that he had this bit of a void that was left after all of the training and the racing was taken out of it. And what he asked me about, he said... Is it one? Is it common for athletes to sort of experience this kind of depression after they leave racing? And should he just say to himself, "Harden up, Milan, uh, and get on with it"? And so this really got me thinking, and it wasn't really something I wanted to uh, reply to in an email. So I asked Milan if he wanted to come on and have a chat, and this is the interview about that. We talk about um, that email that he sent me, um, his past, how he experienced, uh, well, what he experienced after he sort of stepped away from racing. And me personally, I mean, I'll, I'll quite happily say that my general mood is very heavily dependent on exercise. Um, and looking back on it and reflecting, when I was younger, I had a real issue controlling my temper apparently i used to lash out at my sisters uh, on on a on a you know regular basis and i blame that entirely on them because they <laughs> had a real knack at winding me up but what my mum used to make me do is whenever i was starting to get really frustrated and angry at my sisters or or just being a pain i guess she'd send me out to run around the back paddock because we lived down in the country there's a big grass paddock field out the back of our house and I would literally just run laps around this paddock whenever um, my mum saw me getting frustrated. And I think that's transitioned into uh, my life in general and potentially spurred my interest uh, in endurance sport and that sort of thing as well. But I find that uh, my mood is heavily dependent on if I've exercised or if I haven't been able to exercise or train because of things uh, that come up um then it's it's a bit of a struggle for me i i get really kind of short and frustrated and that really annoys me that i get like that but two i kind of like it because i know i can fix it by going and exercising so it has this kind of double-edged sword for me and so we talk a little bit around that um around stepping away from exercise or stepping away from endurance racing and endurance training on a serious note and how that can be hard for some people. So sit back, have a listen, um, and we'll see you on the other side. I hope 
it is interesting for you. So here is the interview with Milan Brodina. Enjoy. On a little bit of my background, um, when, I, when I first came to New Zealand 14 e years ago, and a friend of mine, he lent me a tape of uh, Eco Challenge, uh, Adventure mm -hmm. Race, and I just... And when, when I saw Nathan's father in there struggling and going through the hard parts of the race, uh, at that moment, it's, uh, it very resonated with me. Uh, that, yeah, pretty much that challenge and that moment when I saw, when I saw Nathan uh, going, uh, going through dark moments. And it's because uh, in our comfy lives, we are living in comfy homes, uh, there, there are no wars in New Zealand, or yeah, there are in some parts of the world. It's pretty, uh, it's challenging to live. But in the Western world, world um, we've got pretty much no worries at all. We can go to the supermarket, we can buy food. Uh, everyone can, anyone can buy food. Uh, we come home. We've got a, we've got warm homes. We can we turn on the tellies and we can we can drive cars. So the, the lives as we know it, they are so comfortable. So I pretty much, and I believe that's uh, why so many people uh, maybe do, let's say, adventure races, if, if, I, if, I, if I carry on with the adventure racing thing. Mm -hmm. Because we've got, we've got, our lives are sort of boring <laughs> if we don't find ourselves uh, uh, extra challenge. And, you know, in the past, when, you know, our ancestors, you know, they had their adrenaline going through their blood all the time when they were hunting, when they were, you know, they, they needed to go through the adrena, adre, adrenaline stages to, to, to provide for their families to hunt and they didn't know where their next food is going to come from and uh, build shelters and everything was sort of, sort of real. And uh, so, and maybe I've got uh, in my genes, my, I got a little bit, a little bit more on that. So I was, uh, because as I said, our lives are comfortable. So I, I was looking for that extra challenge to get that uh, adrenaline, adrenaline kick and hit. And so that's why I, yeah, I was, uh, I took on some adventure racing and some other um, sporty challenges. And yeah, and I got, uh, I got. Uh, uh, very enthusiastic about it and that whole um, sports gear and that that the, the, the sport the, to improving uh, to mm -hmm. to improve in the sport get better and yeah so I've 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 really I was really focusing for 10 years I was uh, plus minus I was really focusing on uh, yeah get, getting better in that and uh, searching the uh, searching the kicks, uh, searching the challenges uh, that the races uh, provided, and yeah, the training as well. In the the inter, yeah, the the training is a uh, you know because you are training for ten weeks and that race is few hours, one day, you know, two days, three days, mm -hmm. but you are training for it for a long time. So training is a it's a bigger part of that, and I was using the training as a as a opportunity to. To get out of the comfort, um, comfort of the comfortable environment, and uh, so that that was probably the reason why I, why I uh, was doing it for such a long time, why I didn't get bored because mm -hmm. because of the training. Yeah, yep. I think that's a kind of a natural progression for a lot of people as well, isn't it? They they get into endurance sport or adventure adventure racing adventure type sports because they, they want some adventure, um, so they're kind of looking for this challenge or this adventure, and then when, once they get in there, it, then it becomes about improving because you see these results, there's a result sheet, and whenever you see a result sheet with your name on it, you kind of always want to move up a couple of places mm -hmm. and, and improve yourself, whether that just be human nature or, or whatever it is. And I, I think a lot in my experience a lot of people get into are looking for something to, to hold on to and, and to work towards. 
just this natural personal development type thing. And I guess endurance sport sort of leads nicely to that. It gives you that bit of challenge, gives you some direction uh, and some focus. And also you build a little bit of a community around you as well Mm. with the people that you meet. And it ticks a lot of boxes for a lot of people in terms of giving them some significance, giving them a sense of belonging and a sense of purpose uh, and a sense of pride in, in what they do. But I think as well that can start to uh, fall to pieces and when people leave the sport or are no longer able to do the sport in, in the capacity that they used to. And I got an email from you about that exact thing asking when you got out of the sport, uh, and you'll be able to dig into a little bit more detail around why that was, you sort of got into this, and we don't want to call it specifically depression, but you struggled with stepping away from the sport that had given you so much in return, and then you're left with a bit of a void. And how do you fill that void uh, to give you all of those things that the sport's given you in the past? I think it's a, it's a common problem. Yeah, Mary, you pretty much you said it so you said it so right. Yeah, because yeah, uh, during the during the last fourteen years in New Zealand or ten years uh, uh, during the competitive uh, racing, I created a com- community of friends, and we were we were training together, we were seeing each other, uh, we were kayaking together, going into the hills for missions, rafting together, and uh, yeah, it was a great community and uh, a community of friends. And as I said, you know, since uh, you kind of feel when it, you when you you kind of your when your life develop develops you kind of uh, see notice that actually it's probably time you not know, that you are that you want to leave but you, the things are sort of happening in your life so you are sort of being not forced but um, uh, you, your life kind of moves you away from the sport. Uh, mm-hmm. naturally it may be it could be the you know one part of it is age because you you see younger athletes coming through and uh, you see oh there is a there, there's completely new uh, new bunch of people and I don't know anyone uh, around here anymore because mm-hmm. uh, your friends are kind of moving on as well and uh, or it could be that you that you've got a family and then you are thinking all right am I going to spend uh, uh, 10 hours today on the Saturday uh, training in the hills or am I just going to go with uh, with our son to the skate park for a couple hours and mm-hmm. go to his birthday party or uh, go camping with him instead of you know doing doing a full out two-day uh, training weekend so it's sort of like I would call it a natural natural um, progression or development it's just just what happens mm-hmm. and uh, yeah and you, you are right and it's about um, so what I started to do I, I you know my first thing for me to build uh, was to realize it that actually this is actually happening mm-hmm. that uh, I created this uh, this big big void and so I was thinking what you know what shall I do with it with that gap and uh, with the with the focus I had, uh, um, and uh, yeah, so after so it took me a while sort of fight my find my way, but I I think I I got it. Yeah, <laughs> mm. at least I. What what have you filled the void with, Milan? Um, still, as I said, the the adventuring uh, mm. it goes back to the uh, comfort, and that we are still as humans, we are still. Uh, we still want to get that adrenaline and that uh, excitement from things. So I, I I'm trying, and I'm, yeah, I'm trying to fill the, the void with um, other excitement. And so I'm, I'm I set myself challenges. And uh, so at the moment, I, I, I said, all oh, right, I, I would like to. I, I like international traveling and explore, exploring around the world. Mm-hmm. So I told myself, can I? Can I actually make it make it happen so I can I can still carry on doing adventures uh, in the hills um, with my family or yeah in the hills in New Zealand 
or uh, in and or internationally, which will which will fill, fill the void, and that created a huge challenge. And uh, yeah, that was like the same challenge as trying to be better for the next race. Mm-hmm. So this was pretty much a challenge for me. How can I make it work? What about uh, uh, Lance's uh, um, our son uh, school? Are they going to accept it? What about my work? What about if I if I go uh, if we go away for four months, three months? Mm-hmm. Um, are we going to be physically capable of uh, uh, doing some rafting in Nepal? Uh, doing 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 some uh, some bike packing challenges in uh, Croatia? Or doing doing some uh, doing some trips in uh, in uh, in Borneo, and uh, so that kind of that challenge kind of created little challenges. So yeah. with our son, I, I I we are trying to make sure that he's fit enough and that he's enjoying it to to go to Borneo, and mm-hmm. uh, wasn't bothered that he's getting bitten by mosquitoes and that we that we are hitchhiking through Borneo, sitting on pickup trucks and uh, yeah, going for hours and hours uh, hitchhiking on the back of pickup truck and uh, yeah, so that's what's fill, filling the void at the moment. So how old's uh, Lance at the moment? He's uh, he's seven. Oh, sorry. Last weekend he turned eight, so he's mm-hmm. eight. So he's eight years old. Probably more world travelled than most of the <laughs> average population <laughs> out there, by the sounds of it. And so it sounds like you've taken your that drive for endurance sport and, and put it, um, you know, back into your family, which is which is awesome as well. Yeah, that I'm sort of uh, I'm sort of. Uh, uh, covering covering two bits. I'm getting my personal uh, personal uh, satisfaction mm-hmm. of uh, of the of the next challenge. And you you said it at the beginning very nicely, Mary. You said about the progression. It's our human thing to progress to be better as soon as we see the uh, the result sheet. Uh, so I'm getting my uh, my satisfaction from from that that I can. Uh, that uh, can I make it happen? So this is my satisfaction, and the other, the other side of it that uh, that I am not doing it uh, by myself and for myself, because I see the big benefits that uh, Lance and Lucy, my my, my partner and, uh, and Lance, that they are going to get from it. For example, mm-hmm. um, so that was that was the reason why I why I chose to go this direction. That I'm not just benefiting myself. That I am. Um, sort of benefiting other people as well, you know. Mm, that's interesting. So you sort of like get yourself that new mission, don't you? Because I think one of the biggest problems when athletes get out of sport is that they've lost uh, such a huge part of their life and it's what what do they do now? And mm. I sort of faced a similar crossroads um, and when I was moving away from multi-sport as well, um, kind of through just general busyness when I was doing my masters, I was I was trying to do a lot of different things and I wasn't doing any of them very well. Uh, and there was a couple of things for my future I needed to do quite well, my study and, and my work as well. So I I sort of put my effort in into those, and and moved away from that competitive multi sport racing. And that is it is really hard to do because. You know, it's something that has been such a big part of your, or especially for my identity personally, for such a long time. I I thought of myself as a multi-sport athlete. Um, I was a multi-sport coach. Uh, there's this, this yeah. expectation, whether that be from other people or from myself, that that's what I needed to be doing. Um, so I, I I battled with that quite a bit as well. But I think the most important thing is to find that next thing where to where to put that energy because so many endurance athletes are you know ADHD type uh, personalities where they just got all this energy that needs to go somewhere um, and if it doesn't go somewhere then you know it can lead down that sort of dark path of, of depression yeah. as well uh, um, 100% agree Matty yeah um, and another another uh, golden thing you just mentioned is the is the identity because um, 
you, you, uh, you as Medi, you identified yourself as a, you said it as a, as mm -hmm. a multi-sport athlete, and and now and there was you had you had people around you and the world watching you, uh, the world <laughs> watching you, <laughs> and now you are you are you are not multi-sport thing anymore. And, mm -hmm. and but that's what you identified yourself as, and now you are saying that you are not that anymore. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's gotta get because we all are identifying uh, ourselves with something. If that's mom or dad, you mm -hmm. know, that's that's identity. If that's if that's a uh, uh, if that's a CEO or it can be it can be a uh, squash coach. So we yep. all got, you know, it could be a few different identities. We are all wearing different hats, but, you know, some identities, some hats are bigger than others. And then when we, it was, it was very hard for me, and it is still hard to not see myself as a multi-sport athlete. Because, yeah, I still see myself, but, you know, in kind of different way. And mm. that's, that's the hard part that... Yeah, kind of apart myself with the identity. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I I'm think sort of you... trying to and I'm Sorry, sort of go, trying to create ahead. a new new identity a little bit myself as a mm -hmm. as a as a sport uh, sporty adventure or that we are a sporty family. So yeah, it's made them um, sporty uh, traveling adventurous family yeah so <laughs> mm. and it's kind of ridiculous when you think about it that uh you know that you need to be thought of as or seen as something mm. versus just being seen as as milan and you mm. know milan and lance and lucy they go out and do these these fun things not because they're a sporty adventuring family but just because that's what they like to go and do you know in it's something that I th I think about as as well, in that, um, you know, I put a lot of my time and effort in into my family as as well, and it's always that trying to be a, a great dad, and I don't know what uh, a great dad is, um, and it's always something that I kind of work towards and, and refine, but I I think a large part of it is is time, you know, time with with your kids, obviously, so it's that. Yeah, that that changing of of identities is a is an interesting thing, and in how we sort of rationalise that that in our minds. Yeah, it it is all in our minds, right? It pretty mm. much, maybe you know the the rest of the world. Yeah, maybe you know the rest of the world. It's a bit it's a big uh, big saying, but uh, I would say that everyone is busy with their with our own uh, identities we are creating that. Not no one cares about about you sort of in a way. Mm. And if you will say, oh, I moved away from from multi sport racing, and because uh, I, I'm putting my focus into this, they will say, yep, that's good. So it's uh, it is all in our heads. And uh, so the same way as uh, depression, it is pretty much in our heads. Mm. It's uh, nowhere else. It's all. It's a uh, it's a cloud that we create in our heads. Uh, no one else created created it, and no one else can get rid of it. It's 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 the only thoughts in our heads. Mm, and you can see why uh, you know athletes that have been at the top of their game, such as Steve Gooney, and he talks about that a lot mm. in his book, uh, Lucky Legs, yeah. about how he found himself standing on you know the edge of the cliff at uh, some of the beach yeah. there overlooking the coast to coast finish line essentially uh and ready to jump off and commit suicide just because he he felt especially after his um his illness of lepto what was it called when he got bitten by the bat um over got infected by bat dung over in borneo and he he just he said he saw that he wasn't going to be able to do what he always wanted to do or what he always did, and that was um, be a great athlete and, and win a lot of races. And if that part of his identity was taken away from him, then he was left with with nothing essentially. Mm. And then he and then he talks about it later on when he completely stepped down from his racing career um, at the end of it with sort of a buggered ankle. And 
I was rereading some of it yesterday, just looking through it before we had a chat, mm-hmm. and he made a really interesting statement about. So this is after 20 years of um, of racing and training, and it finally came to a halt because he had uh, issues with his ankles. His ankles were a bit buggered from a couple of injuries he'd had, had lots of operations. They didn't really go that well, and they were just sore, and he couldn't compete any longer. And he said, deep inside me, there was a kind of relief. I had an excuse to stop racing, and it seemed strange, but it was nice. Which I thought that was kind of interesting, and that he (laughs) almost sounds like he was looking for a way out for a while, but couldn't stop because it was so much a part of him. And then he's got this excuse, if you like, oh, my ankles, I can't keep racing. That's kind of a nice excuse, a nice reason to, to have, you know, to stop. That's, uh, yeah, you're, again, you know, you're, you hit it uh, again on the nail. It's, that's exactly. Uh, you, are sort of, you are sort of looking for a reason why, why it will be, uh, why it is necessary to stop. Because when you are, when when it's kind of like that you are actually putting the the reason why uh, why to stop racing onto someone else. It's like someone else is making the decision for you. Mm. Because if you gotta make the decision yourself and be confident in the decision, it seems like we we are a little bit struggling to make the decision and be confident in the decision. But it seems like with Steve's uh, Gurney's ankle, it was like sort of like someone else made a decision for him. And Absolutely. it was easier to accept it than if the decision would come from ourselves, which is, which is interesting, isn't it, Maddie? Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. I think the other interesting side of things as well is it seems like there's a lot of um, endurance athletes out there of all, of all levels, but they are addicted to the sport for for Mm. want of a better word and that there's this continual high that you get from when you achieve it or complete an event or a race and that feeling that you get and it's kind of hard to get that feeling from from elsewhere in your life so you sort of go in this this cycle of finding a race training for it this anticipation of it makes you feel really good then you do the race and then you come down off it you have your post race blues as many people do uh, and then if you haven't been that organized you look for another race and you choose another one or there's already about six races lined up that you're going to keep working towards and there's just this continual cycle of building up to a race coming down from it building up to another one getting these little highs to mm. keep you to keep yourself going um, and it's kind of like, uh, I guess, a junkie who gets uh, goes into rehab and has to come off that addiction almost of where do they now get their highs from when the thing that was giving them their highs is taken away. Yeah, and addiction in general, it's you know, it's 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 not a good thing. Doesn't matter what addiction it is. It can be an addiction to do uh, to do drugs. It can be addiction to do uh, to do sex to have sex. Uh, addiction to do sport. Um, yes. And how how to deal with I, uh, now? You know, when I, when I look back, I, I I was pretty much addicted to that to that highs uh, mm. to those highs, and I yeah I was. I was a I, I was a junkie, and I gotta say I'm, I still I, I still am. Um, but you know, w- what is the best thing to deal with uh, addiction? It's not to it's not to take things away from him. It's not uh, uh, to take uh, to take drugs away from a uh, from a junkie. That's that's not a good thing because you know it's it's very hard to to cross it. Or if someone is alcoholic, you know, it's you can't take away alcohol from him because he will just go secretly and search it. Mm-hmm. I think what what a, what a better thing is to um, start to incorporate new things into our lives, and they will slowly, which may or will or yeah, and will slowly replace uh, the the old addiction uh, as long as we do it in a in a reasonable way. Mm-hmm. Um, 
for example, if you are an alcoholic and you drink lots of, uh, lots of alcohol, if you say, I'm going to drink two and a half liter of water, pure water a day, or coconut water, or pure water a day. And maybe you, you find yourself that if you stay focused on that, that actually you are, you are replacing uh, the old addiction with mm. new addiction, which is sort of a healthy. So, and maybe that's what uh, maybe that's what I'm doing, or now that actually I'm slowly replacing the old addiction with with some new focus, which is uh, which is uh, the, the the traveling and the and the family adventuring. But because I'm with there, there is one difference that I'm that I'm aware of the past and I'm. Uh, I may be older. I'm, 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 I'm wiser. So I think I'm coming to it with a with a new perspective, and I'm yeah. hoping with a little bit healthier perspective that I don't end up um, in a hole, in a dark place when we are not able to to do these things anymore. When we can't go uh, adventuring with the family, um, mm. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think, um, you know, one of the key things about what's an addiction and what's, you know, not an addiction is that, is it hurting you or is it hurting others? You know, is it interfering with work or, or life and that sort of thing as well? And I definitely think there's, there's, you know, there's people out there that have a genuine addiction to exercise, um, which can be quite dangerous for them or, you know, for the others in their lives as well. And I think we need to be aware of that. Um, and and it's obviously something that you need to ask for help for as well if mm. it is is a problem because there's a lot of people out there um, that have pushed themselves so hard they've done irreversible damage to their body mm. you know and, and we think about that as being you know kind of awesome that someone was able to push themselves that mm. hard or that they're that committed to the sport or whatever it might be but when you actually think about it it's quite a negative thing. Um, you know, females that aren't that are infertile now because of their of their training loads or of their, their intake of energy. And I think while you, the use of exercise, kind of on a slightly different tangent, the use of exercise is really beneficial in helping uh, people who have you know clinical depression. But I never think that people should rely on exercise or training as a treatment for depression. If you genuinely have clinical depression, there needs to be some medical supervision of that. And I've had experiences in the past of essentially people trying to treat their depression through the exercise that they do. Um, mm. And I think that's a that's a slippery slope that we need to be aware of. Since we're talking around the, the subject uh, in, in general, that needs to be at the forefront of people's minds. <clears throat> um, and the the other thing is is as a as a coach, I guess, is that there is you do see quite a lot of that of people. I'm not, and I'm not sure if it's a personality thing in in for endurance sport, but it seems to be a lot of people in it have kind of an addictive personality or are trying to fill a gap in their life with endurance sport. And maybe that could be quite a healthy way of doing it, um, but it's always healthy until it's not healthy. And there's usually kind of a fine line between those two as well before you cross over um, into that negative damaging side of, uh, of things as well. So I'd just say be aware of it, and um, if you do need, you know, help, then definitely reach out. I mean, I'm no expert in um, in depression or managing addictions and that sort of thing, but if you do reach out to me, I'll be able to help you in the right direction and point you to some people that that can help. Uh, Mary, uh, oh, it's great actually. Actually, this is the first podcast, or actually first coach. I should I should say the first coach I uh, that I'm that I'm hearing, or that I yeah that I that, that I'm noticing that actually hearing that actually is talking about uh, 
what's going to happen after that he's realizing all of these things because mm-hmm. many of the coaches they are here here is a plan and it's eight weeks and you start to build up do a base and then you are peaking and it's you know it's it's that stuff but this is you know that 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 this is only one side of everything and to have a coach who is actually openly talking about uh, on podcasts, for example, and talking about what's going to happen after after the mm. racing season finishes, I think that uh, you are putting yourself into into a val- very valuable uh, category of uh, yeah. It's yeah. I was going to say it's great. It's really great that you actually that you are that you are talking about it. Um, Yes, I mean, it's an important subject, isn't it? Because we're not dealing with just uh, robots, we're dealing with people. Um, And especially, say, in the high-performance setting as well, there's a whole area in high-performance that is dedicated, it's called athlete life. And what it's designed to do is often, if you can imagine, there's a young kid comes into the high-performance system that identified at a young age that they're going to be a good athlete in whatever their sport is. So they start training um, and they, they, you know, train and race and compete for their country. And then 20, 30 years down, or even 10, 10 years down the track, they come out of it. They're in their mid twenties. They're injured. They never went to university because they, uh, they were training and racing so much. Uh, And then they just sort of discarded, if you like, and you look around the world at big uh, high performance programs and there's so many broken people out there um, that have gone through the system, they've done really well, uh, and then they've come out the other side and they're left with nothing essentially um, because they're broken. And then in New Zealand at least, our high performance sport, we have a whole area dedicated to athlete life and there's people that sit down with the athletes and plan Uh, plan B if you like what's going to happen after sport Uh, and they get them enrolled in 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 university papers so not only are they being an athlete Mm -hmm. they're also being a student at the same time to give them their uh, their exit strategy so when they finish competing then they're going to go and do this because if an athlete doesn't have that or if a person doesn't have that then um, you know you're just leading them down the path of of depression after sport or just the the path of ruin because they're going to be broken they're not going to have an income they've never had to think about money coming in because they've always been sponsored or they've you know had money thrown in their direction and then all of a sudden it's all gone they don't know how to cook yeah. because they've had people cooking for them you know whatever it might be yeah. I think that that's 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 awesome that actually this uh, something like that is available in New Zealand. That's that's mm. awesome. I, I, I was always a, a big fan of uh, having having a plan B or having sort of having two things happening at the same at the same time. Oh, and uh, yeah, so when uh, always kind of be aware that yeah, what about you know if that doesn't work. A great saying, you know, don't put all your eggs into one basket. And mm, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of that. That's like, you know, if you if you are going to invest your money, don't put all your money in, in, into this in, into these shares because who knows? Uh, so it's always good to put a little bit of the money into the properties, a little bit of money in, into the shares. Uh, yeah, just always have sort of. Yeah, like a plan B. So even if you are if you are 100% focused on the on the path you are now on the uh, on the on the on the plan A, but yeah, sort of have a plan B and plan C in mind. Yeah, I think that's that's uh, yeah, that's a good approach. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and you have personally come uh, head first, I guess, into another big barrier. Just a couple of weeks ago, tell us about that. Yeah, that's. Uh, <laughs> I got a laugh about it because uh, yeah, over the last uh, many many years, I was doing some. Uh, I did some racing around the world, racing in China and lots of adventure races and kayak rivers and 
caves and did all sorts of things and then just <laughs> four or five weeks ago I was doing a morning uh, dark run uh, so it was still I, I had my headlamp on and I was running and just um, it was just uh, locally in uh, in our little town and coming out of the forest uh, there was a speed bump and I I was looking somewhere else on a different track where I would like to go and I turned my head away it was downhill I haven't seen the, the speed bump and I landed uh, on it with my heel in a just a bad combination of things with my heel so then my uh, then my knee went the other way and uh, I broke the tibia, the tibia plateau, which is uh, yeah, very painful, uh, very painful injury. And uh, so I'm uh, now I'm out now getting around the with, with the help the of these, yeah, with the crutches. Um, and uh, so after that, I was doing lots of swearing because it was very painful. So. I didn't have my cell phone with me, and it was still dark, so I, I had to make a plan. And I would say that, uh, yeah, racing in the past, because it was the physical pain that, uh, uh, which was at the, at the first probably far, four minutes, three minutes, it was like I was swearing, it was very painful. Mm -hmm. But then sort of you, you sort of from, from race, uh, yeah, I kind of, got, I got back into the, you know, oh, what a, back into the sort of being organized when I when I used to be organized and being strategic during my racing time I was like all right you know I need to make a plan what I'm going to do so I was uh, uh, yeah I made a plan and how I'm going to get some help and and so on so uh, so first after this first initial three minutes I snapped out of it uh, clear my head and started to uh, started to bump slide down the hill dragging my one leg behind me for 45 minutes uh to get some help and <laughs> but uh yeah that's awesome so that, that's my little challenge <laughs> it reminds me of the uh the podcast i did on touching the void have you listened to that one yet with, with uh, joe no, simpson I I, uh no 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 i didn't yet uh, i haven't yet <laughs> Do you you know the story of touching the void? Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I read I read some of that book, and it's such a brutal book in terms of what yes. you know, crawling six miles over the glacial moraine, um, mate. So it sounded like you just harden up, and you know you got on with it. Yeah, that's right. And you know the same. It, life is life is like that. Yeah, the 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 initial part, you know, it hurts. And it doesn't doesn't hurt to make a wee cry, but mm -hmm. then you just say, oh, just 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 hard enough, just get <laughs> over it, hard enough, and get on with it, and and just get on. Yeah. But I think it's important to have the initial cry and uh, <laughs> to sort of realize where are you at and sort of let the, let the emotions out. Yeah, to start with, and then get on. Yeah. I just I just released a podcast today about. Uh, the continuum of suffering and your ability to endure pain. Um, and at one end, it's kind of like at home, in your living room, you're not really going to endure much pain before you give up on it. And the, I reckon down the other end is, you know, a survival situation where your life depends on it or, you know, the, uh, the lives of your loved ones depend on it. And I think, you know, breaking your leg is, is right down this end, isn't it, where you... You're just going to deal with the pain because if you don't, well, you're going to be there for a while. That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Just uh, yeah, just deal with it. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Fantastic. So I think if we jump back to the uh, the original email that you that you sent through to me, I'll just pull it up here. And you said after your after your decision to step away from from you know competitive training and racing after 10 years um you had that that gap that you wanted to replace things with and you, and you sort of said so is is this sort of depression that you were finding yourself in is the answer to it mm -hmm. just to harden up and i thought mm, 
the hard enough project has never been about dealing with depression. Mm. Uh, and I don't think hardening up is the way necessarily to deal with uh, clinical depression. So if you are, you know, going through clinical depression, then I would highly recommend that you get some professional help over um, some guy on a podcast telling people to harden up. Hardening up for me was always about that physical pain and suffering you go through in endurance sport specifically because that that's my background. And it sort of has transitioned into something that I use in my day-to-day -day life as well. But is it something used to uh, get yourself through, you know, depression and, and hard times? Well, if it works for you, by all means use it. But I'd never say that it was the only thing that you should use. Um, if you've got a broken leg and you've got to get into some, uh, get some, get to safety to get help, you know, it's the same thing. I'd never say just use harden up to mend your broken leg. I'd say, sure, use harden up to get yourself down the hill back to safety and then go and get some medical, uh, medical help to do it. Because depression is a, you know, a chemical imbalance in your brain caused by many different factors. And often that's what needs to be addressed, either what's happening in your life or those chemical imbalances as well. So use hard enough as you like, but uh, it's not the cure for everything and especially not the cure for uh, clinical depression. But I think the first step is to harden up and ask for help, whatever your situation might be. And that would be my main thought on the subject. What are your thoughts, Milan? Uh, hundred percent. I don't think so. That uh, if you are uh, if you are being mentally challenged, I don't think so. That uh, hard enough is the answer. I believe the uh, I believe the answer is uh, yeah, sort of uh, community and and people around you and yeah, to talking about it. Like you know, talking to mm -hmm. you, you know, it's it's great and. People have got different ideas, and some many many of people, many of the uh, many of your friends, they've been in the in the in the same boat, so they might have some ideas. Yeah, yeah so uh, yeah, I agree. Hard enough uh, in this situation of uh, how to deal with when you when you step away from in this other case uh, of a step away from uh, competitive racing. It is it is an answer. No, mm. but and it's uh, often the hardest part, isn't it? Is is that initial talking about it or bringing it up uh, or asking for the help. And I would definitely say hard enough and ask for help and harden up and, and talk about it yeah. um, so that then things can happen. But yeah, that's, hard well, enough and sucking it up to get through it, it's not, it's not the way. 100%. 100%. Yeah, it took me a while, actually, to uh, after you launched the, uh, the Hard Enough project to write to, 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 write to the email. Uh, uh, just to yeah, just to uh, talk to you about it because mm -hmm. you have been uh, you have been part of my life or you have been you've been my coach for for many many years, and now I thought, oh man, if I'm going to write him my this email and uh, with this content contest uh, contents, you know how is he going to look at me? Uh, because I was uh, I was competitive and I, was, I yeah I, I did some I achieved some great great results and uh, so I was like maybe I don't want to Matthew to look at me like this so but uh, yeah so in this case I would say yeah we used to harden up just uh, share share it share it with your community share it with your friends mm -hmm. with your family and but not hard enough to meant the challenge, no. Yeah. It's interesting, like the community thing, like one of the things that is going to predict how long people live is how connected they are with uh, their mm -hmm. community. So that isolation, especially with uh, elderly people um, who often don't see a lot of people on the day-to-day -day because they're, you know, retired, they don't, they're not overly mobile, many of their friends have died. One of the greatest predictors of how long you're going to live is actually how strong that community is around you and that sense of belonging, which is which is pretty 
one phenomenal and two too amazing and you can mm. kind of relate to it because we are you know we are pack animals you know we yes. come from a tribe yeah. and we and we gravitate towards other people a lot of the time as well so developing that community around you and it kind of links back to why so many people enjoy endurance mm. sports i think is, is is that community that gathers around and as soon as you step away from that community um you need to find another one. You need to find uh, other people. Hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. So yeah. So you are sort of uh, you are sort of covering two things. You are you are again. You know what, what we talk about, Mary. You are actually you are actually um, not try to try to cut on that on that uh, addiction. You are trying to. Fill fill it with something else. Mm. Like start to drink two liters of water, two and a half liters of water a day. You are you are you are uh, putting yourself or surrounding yourself with different community. So maybe mm. there might not be such a such a big low. So yep. because you sort of naturally progress from one community of uh, sporty people into into another community. And, and mm. Yeah. And, and, you know, those interests that whatever you're interested in and find Mm. other things to um, get you excited because, I mean, that's what life is all about. Life's about living, isn't it? And it's, um, you know, about going and doing things that you enjoy, whatever whatever they may be. Um, Get out there and and do them and enjoy them as that's, uh, at the end of the day, that's all you're going to have. Mm. That's incredible, mate. Hey, um, thank you so much for your time. I won't hold you up any longer. You've got obviously important things to be doing. But uh, thanks for your time. Thanks for uh, reaching out, uh, wanting to talk around the subject. I think there will be a lot of people out there that um, can relate to this and hopefully opens up their eyes and minds a little bit around around this. And hopefully... Um, if anyone needs any help uh, or wants to know what the next step is, uh, reach out to either myself or Milan and we'll uh, be happy to point you in the right direction. All right. Thank you very much, Matty. Uh, good awesome. chat. Uh, good, good talking to you. too, Milan. Have a good one, mate. You too. Bye. So, Nick... What did you think, mate? That is probably one of the best interviews I've heard in a very long time. And I spend a lot of time listening to podcasts uh, and audiobooks and so forth. And the way you guys were talking, I guess, around the topic of depression um, is, is really, really cool and, I guess, refreshing. And like Milan said, in terms of, I guess, your approach as a coach um, to dealing with, with athletes in that kind of post-race um, sort of depressed state, um, is, is quite unique. Um, it's not just a, you know, I oh, just harden up and, and move on. There is actually something there to kind of be, to be conscious of, um, I guess. And probably for me, the biggest part is, is raised, and it's come up a few times with people that have talked to me around this harden up project since we've started. Um, is we're not here telling people that are, you know, clinically depressed to harden up, and that that's all you need to do, and that's going to fix your problem. Um, being clinically depressed is a um, is a very serious thing, and, and you do need to seek some medical help. Um, but also, if you if you need to talk to somebody, you know, you're having some some down, depressed, sort of low mood talk, thoughts, or you're just not feeling happy, um, or if you're feeling happy, talk to someone. You know, go talk to your neighbour, talk to your friends, um, talk to us if you want to. Um, you know, there's no one would ever turn away someone that wants to talk, um, and. I'd encourage people on the other end to always listen to someone that's coming to, to, you know, to talk to them. If you don't have time at that moment, just make sure they feel like they can come back, you know, in half an hour or, hey, look, come around for a cup of tea tonight or whatever it might be um, and, and give them the time because you never know when that shoe might be on the other foot and you might need someone to, to have a talk to. Um, but I think <clears throat> I think in sport, and, I mean, I've been in, in that situation too, you, you know, you've, you build up to an event, you do the event, it may not go to plan, and you're like, ah, oh, well, I've just spent six months focusing on this one aspect, and you've kind of consumed your life with this one aspect, and that's gone. And you know, in six, twelve, however many hours the the race has taken you, now what do I do? Mm. And it's that whole, hmm, you know, you, you kind of have to rebuild and refocus on a new goal. And 
I think, especially for me, I got to a point where because of that kind of feeling, I would get to maybe a month or three weeks out from the race and I'd be starting to, okay, what's next? And so you don't actually get to the end point. You think, okay, I'm just going to focus on something else now to avoid that hole that you fall into on the other side. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's really cool to to acknowledge that, yes, there is a, a down uh, depression or or down in terms of mood drop off after a race, um, but also then to fill your life with more than just one thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, I think you guys touched on that. The endurance athletes are, are fantastic at consuming their life with their sport, whether it be you know three sports for a triathlon or a multi sport, or one sport for for mountain biking, running, or or cycling, whatever it might be. So to have a focus on your family, you know, you've got a focus of your, your friends group. Um, you've got your focus of your sport. You've always got multiple things going on that you can fall back into when, hey, sport's not going so well or it's, you know, pouring with rain outside, not going to go out and train. I'm going to spend some time with my family and fill that bucket up. And then I'm going to put some time into my work and fill that bucket up. So when it the weather gets better or you get the opportunity to, you can fill up your bucket of training or exercise. Um, and I think, <clears throat> I guess it's a wee bit like the, we, we talk about this analogy of pots and turning pots up and down from a, a, a metabolism point of view and exercise. Um, I like to look at it in terms of buckets from a, a psychological point of view. Um, you know, you, you need to fill those buckets up and it's not so much taking stuff out, it's, it's filling them up because they'll slowly drain away over time. Imagine they've got a, a couple of holes in the bottom that are just slowly leaking out of all the time. You need to keep putting and filling them up. Um, you know, I don't know too many successful relationships or marriages where someone has neglected that component of their life for, for six months plus. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it does yeah. take its toll. Um, and you just have to hope that you've got a partner that's strong enough to tell you, hey, you know, pull your head in and, and focus on me in terms of that respect before it gets too too late. And same with your job. Um, and same with your friends group. If that friends group is outside of your sport group as well. Um, you know, all too, all too often we see people kind of falling out of friends groups or you might have a friend that's doing a different sport to you and you don't see them for three or four months and all of a sudden they want to hang out because their goal's finished and they've got all this time and they've just neglected you for the last three or four months. And, it, you know, those sort of things, again, only take a few a few times to, to wear thin with people. Mm, yeah, really good points there, eh? And I think like that that hamster wheel you described in terms of uh, building up to a race, uh, potentially not going that well, or maybe it did go well, but it could always go better. So what's next mm. and what's next and what's next? And it gets in this, this sort of wheel of uh, never-ending um, pursuit of whatever you're after, which in some respect is, is really good in terms of you're always driving to get better and to pursue this next thing. But again, if it kind of starts to bring you down because, you know, you're not performing or you're coming up to an event and you're just worried about how you're going to go and then you come out of the other side sort of down about it all, then it sort of defeats the whole purpose of doing, uh, you know, endurance sport for enjoyment. And it, it always amazed me how many people would come to me uh, and I could guarantee that they never had a good race and they will never have a race that they're happy with because uh, they, they're they unable to, to grasp that component of, yes, I did really well, uh, maybe it didn't go to you know 100% to plan, but I did this and I've come this far and I've done all these things, but they just could not, couldn't see that. And then it was just that next thing, like, what am I going to do now? And it's always that chasing, and I think, having some time to reflect and be proud of yourself and in, and enjoy, you know, the moment of doing a race and finishing a race rather than just always looking into the future, bang, bang, what's next, what's next, what's yep. next? Yeah, and I think it's it's a bit of the New Zealand psyche too to, to always bring ourselves down when we've been successful. So, mm. you know, oh, I set this goal, I achieved this goal, but I can't pump myself up too much because someone's going to shut me down. Mm. So if I shut myself down and I don't talk about it too much, then it's, it's not quite the same. Um, so I think that's, that's something in New Zealand that we're really bad at. Um, and it probably doesn't help um, from, a I guess, a progressive mental health component that we're always sort of restraining ourselves. Mm. 
Yeah, that's good. Um, anything else that came out of that interview for you, Nick? Uh, possibly, I mean, one thing is around, I guess, rational thinking. Um, and I know we spoke about this a little bit earlier on, but for me, it's always really easy to, to jump emotively to a decision or, and I think Milan talked about this when he had his recent accident mm. where, you know, he was three or four minutes of just like, oh my God, like, um, instead of that rational, okay, how do I get myself out of the situation? Um, and we, as humans, we're very quick to jump to that emotive component. And even more so when we're physically depleted at the end of a race or if we've been training really hard through a big block of training, we're more tired and more likely to be emotional about something than to rationally sit down, okay, work it out, right on with a, a decision down that sort of pathway. So I think that's a big thing just to kind of highlight to people too. It's it's, it's all right to be emotional. Again, like Milan said, um, you know, when I first finished a, my first Ironman, I remember just, I was crying. I was sort of sitting in the tent afterwards. I was just so drained physically like I didn't I didn't feel happy I didn't feel sad I was just like I'm just I've got nothing but I'm just sort of having a bit of a cry um mm -hmm. and that's fine then you know the, but there comes a point where okay I have to sort of rein it in I mean I was in no danger obviously sitting in the recovery tent eating subway sandwiches um but if you're out there in the middle of nowhere and you've got to get yourself to safety you've got to apply some rational logic or you're going to die potentially um so being able to kind of pull that rational kind of component into into line is, is quite a good thing just to keep in the back of the mind I guess while we're mm -hmm. in these potentially sort of down physically drained states yeah excellent I think the, the biggest thing that sort of stuck out to me was that you know like the harden up project was was never meant to do with uh, mental health or depression in, in the first place mm. and I it's kind of weird how it's gone that way because I've had a lot of people you know talk to me uh, about it in that regard um, and you know all that I was kind of thinking was in the first place was that you know when you're out there running riding kayaking swimming and tr or training or whatever it might be and it's starting to get hard and you want to be able to push harder um, sort of my knuckle dragon mentality is just sort of harden up and, and push push more do you know what I mean and mm. um, and then it, it sort of got brought into this whole mental health uh, and depression thing, which when I first thought of it, I was like, oh, I don't want it to go down there. Like, that's not what it's about. It's not never what I intended it to be, you know. Uh, but then I was like, you know what? It, it does have a place there. And mm -hmm. I think the place is, is that if you do need help, well, you need to harden up and ask for it because otherwise it's never going to come. And I think that if the Harden Up project sort of has any relevance to that, that's that's where it is, is harden up and ask for help because that's often the hardest thing to do. Mm. You know what I mean? It's that initial step, that initial step out the door when it's raining and you need to go for a run or that initial step to actually say, yes, I do need some help uh, and I'm going to ask for it. Yep. So while it doesn't apply to mental health at all, it, it definitely does. Perfect. Said perfectly. All righty, mate. Well, we're going to wrap it up there because this interview's dragged on for a while. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you have any questions, comments, feedback, please send them through to us, whatever it might be. Very interested to engage with all of our listeners as much as we can. Hopefully it's been helpful. Um, like I said in the interview with Milan, I'm absolutely no mental health expert at all. But if you do feel like you would like to reach out to Nick or myself, then we're always here uh, to listen or to point you in a direction that might be a little bit better than uh, two knuckle draggers talking about uh, stuff on a podcast. But otherwise, get out there and train hard. But most importantly, train smart. We'll talk to you later. Mate, thanks for listening. If you would like to support this podcast and see it continue into the future, you can do so in a number of ways. Firstly, make sure you subscribe to this channel on whatever platform you are listening. Like and share the podcast on social media to help spread the word. 
If you're feeling really generous, head over and leave a review and a rating over on iTunes. This helps spread the word and develop the podcast. Make sure you check out the range of t-shirts we have over at the Exponential Performance Podcast store. And this includes the Harden Up t-shirts. All the profits from these will go straight back into the podcast directly to help the production of it. All of this will help the podcast continue long into the future so we can keep bringing you the information you need to train hard, but most importantly, train smart. We'll talk to you next week.